Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Chris, worship team, for leading us in worship. What a powerful morning to praise the greatness of our God. We sung it in song. Amen. He is a great God and a king, and he is there to strengthen his church. And that's exactly what we've been in in this series, is talking about strengthened and how God strengthens us to make stronger, to give strength to. You know, without God's strength, we are nothing. And so we are so thankful and blessed today for the strength that he gives us. We are thankful for the work of the letter to the church at Ephesus. And that's where we have been at for the past couple weeks. We are, long, we are in this series uh, working through the letter to the church at Ephesus. And so uh, just a recap and reminder where we've been. We started off this series not in Ephesians, but in Acts. We started off in Acts chapter 18, working through Acts chapter 20, uh, where Paul established the church at Ephesus. He did this with Priscilla and Aquila. They were uh, on their way in a second missionary journey on his way, and they started uh, this church. And once they started, it got it uh, running a little bit. Uh, Paul decided to continue on. Uh, so Paul left Priscilla and Aquila there uh, to minister faithfully to the church at Ephesus. And so uh, after that, he moved from there and went around to uh, the different areas. And then he came back a little while later to uh, Ephesus and stayed there for about two and a half, almost three years. And uh, during his time there, he taught about the goodness of God. He taught st strong doctrine inside and outside of the synagogue uh, to any who would listen. Uh, and he really made a great impact in Ephesus in that day. And so we know this was a uh, extremely diverse city. Uh, the word Ephesus literally means desirable. It was the place that people wanted to live. Uh, it was a place like, if you think like a New York or California, lots of people coming in from all over trade routes. Uh, coming in and so it was a perfect place to establish a church and that's exactly what they did they set it up established it uh, Paul after his time coming back on his third missionary journey from staying there for uh, about two and a half years then left uh, to finalize his missionary journey and we know after that he wound up in prison in Rome and so about five years after he left Ephesus that last time that's when he wrote the letter to the church at Ephesus. So about 10 years after the start of that church, uh, that's when this letter was coming forth from Paul uh, to that church in Ephesus. And so what a great letter it was. Uh, he started off by really letting them know who it was that was writing it, and we got to see that uh, a couple weeks ago. It was Paul, somebody who genuinely cared for the people, uh, somebody who had the authority to write to them, uh, the authority that came from God Almighty, and so his words were truth to them, and they desired to follow it. He brought forth a good message, a message of encouragement to this strong church, this faithful church. He let them know about their faithfulness in God and about how they were adopted into God's family. For believers in Jesus Christ today, if you are a believer you are adopted into his holy family it's a great thing to know and a truth to behold today and so then he wanted to encourage them about what was going to come the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places about perfect completion that occurs because of what Jesus did for us and his pure cleansing for dying for us on the cross and his shed blood that gives us that personal connection that we're going to get to have with God for all eternity and so Paul wanted to encourage and to strengthen uh, the church there at Ephesus with this fact about a predetermined inheritance that he had established for him and about this permanent seal of the Holy Spirit that was upon them. Uh, and then we dove in last week to looking at verses 15 through 23 and we got to see uh, Paul's long-winded run-on sentence uh, for that of a prayer for the church at Ephesus and letting them know how he was praying for them. Uh, and what an encouraging message it was, I believe, when they probably opened this up and read this letter to see, wow, Paul is thankful. He was thankful for the church. He was thankful for their faithfulness to God and their faithfulness and love toward each other. And as I told you last week, I think when we look at this letter to the church at Ephesus, it's like looking at the letter to Ridgecrest because we are a faithful church that loves God and that loves people. And that's exactly what he was doing. He was strengthening them and encouraging them and saying, guys, you're doing great and I'm so thankful. And he said this in his prayer. And then he dove into some prayer of supplication, right? Some things that he was praying for them from wisdom, from God, from knowledge from God that they would be illuminated in their hearts to remember exactly how they were dead and how they're alive and what God had done for them and how they're living in the light of Jesus Christ and to remember and to really remind them that they have a hope in him. Uh, and through that hope, there's an inheritance to come and also through that relationship with Christ, there's power. And we got to see that in the prayer that Paul prayed 
for the church at Ephesus. And then at the end of his prayer, then he dove into a really impassioned just message of who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ has done. And so it was extremely encouraging. I know last week, if you missed it, go back. You can watch it on our website, uh, richcrest.org. You can hit the media link and then hit past sermons. If you miss one in the series or you just want to go back and get a refresher, that'll help you to do that. But today, let me tell you, I am so excited about today's message. Out of the entire Bible, this is probably, without a doubt, my favorite passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. So if you have the Word of God there, would you turn that in? But I'm telling you, I am so happy and excited today to bring forth this passage of scripture. I am happier than a Kardashian at a yoga pants sale. Let me tell you, I am thrilled to be here today to be able to deliver this. Happier than a squirrel at a planter's nut factory. You know what I'm talking about? It is a great day to look at this passage of scripture because here's the deal. This morning, God tells us how we are strengthened with grace. We are strengthened today with grace. And that's exactly what Paul wanted to tell the church at Ephesus and what he wants us to know today. The Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. It'll be on the screen for you if you don't have your word this morning here. And you were dead with your trespasses and sins and you which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved." And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming age, the ages to come, he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a result, it is a gift of God, not a result of works. Lest any man should boast so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your truth this morning. We thank you for this word. God, I pray that this morning as we open up this word, as we devour your message to the church at Ephesus, that God, you will illuminate our hearts to remind ourselves where we were before we had a relationship with you. And God, where we are now that we have a relationship with you. And so, Jesus, we thank you for the fact that you have rescued us and redeemed us, God, that you've given us the opportunity to have a relationship with you today. And today, God, I do pray that if someone in here, someone watching online does not know about who you are, Jesus, and what you've done and does not have a personal relationship with you, that today would be that special day. For it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Well, this passage reveals how far believers have come. What we have been brought forth from is the bondage of death to the blessings of life eternal with Jesus Christ. Verse 7 even told us this in chapter 1, right? That Jesus shed his blood on Calvary for the redemption of mankind, for deliverance, so that we could be rescued. And Paul even ended his prayer, like I said, by talking about the goodness and the greatness of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. How he came, how he lived, how he died for us. And then he gave us the power and the power and the ability to have faith in him. But we've been brought forth from death to life because of what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. And notice here how Paul took the church at Ephesus really on a historical journey. For many of you believers today, this is going to be very similar to what you went through in your life. If you're not a believer today, maybe this can be your historical journey. But there's some historical lessons here that Paul wanted to give to the church to remind them about where they've been and where they are currently in Christ. And so today, let's look at that. First off today, historical lesson number one is this. You were dead. And you were dead in your trespasses. In verse one, he said, in which you once walked. You followed in the course of this world. Before the church became the church, it was lost, it was depraved, it was wicked, it was vile, it was detestable in God's sight. As Paul put it here, he said the church, before it became the church, was necros in the Greek. It was dead. Now literally, oftentimes that word in the Greek would mean that it is somebody who's lifeless, deceased. 
somebody that has breathed their last breath, somebody that is dead. Now, I don't know about you, but I have never seen somebody who is physically dead doing anything. It doesn't happen. When you're physically dead, you can't do anything. You can't move, you can't breathe, you can't talk, can't see, can't do anything. And so here in this text, he uses this in a really a figuratively way, not to reference literally dead, because obviously the people were physically alive, but they were spiritually dead. They were inactive. They weren't operative. They weren't doing anything spiritually for God. You know, friends, if we understand this text correctly, he was explaining how you can't do anything for God until God does something for you. This imagery here of what the people were dead in, he tells them exactly what they were dead in. He said they were dead in their trespasses. The word in the Greek, parapatomo, means really to fall beside or near something. And as in the Bible, oftentimes it's used to reference a sin, a misdeed, a misstep, or even a trespass. And he also says, not only were you dead in your trespasses, those missteps to falling, but you're also dead in your sins, the word hamartia in the Greek, talking about erring or missing the mark. We know today that every human being, save one, has struggled with sin in their life and has committed sin. The Bible tells us this in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. We have all messed up. We have all erred. We have all transgressed. And we have all fallen short of his glory. We have sinned against a holy God. The people could not free themselves from the bondage of sin's power. But instead, the world had a terribly strong grip on them. Notice what he said in verse 2. He said, in which you once walked, following the course of this world. Once walked is in the aorist tense. It means that it is an action that occurred in the past and is completed. In other words, he's saying this, it cannot be denied that you once walked according to the course of this world. Friends, listen, today is the same for us as well. We have all fallen prey to the sinful choices and decisions in the past. We've made mistakes and we've walked according to the course of this world. There's no denying the wickedness of our former life. The church at Ephesus was no different. But instead of being friends with God, they sought to be friends with the world. I think, though, when I look at this text of Scripture in verses 1 through 3, I look at these texts of Scripture and I say, praise the Lord that this was written to remind the church of where they were, where they had once been and where they had been delivered from, never to walk in that former way of life again. You know, James even cautioned the church who was struggling with some of this walking in the course of the world. Uh, he even warned them about staying away from it as well to the people who were scattered abroad from persecution. James 4.4 4 says this, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Friends, let me tell you, he gives us historical lesson. Number one, you were dead. If you're a believer in Christ, you were dead. If you're not a believer in Christ, hear me today, you are dead. Historical lesson number two says you were idolatrous. Verse two continues, following the prince of the power of the air that, is, that the spirit is now were at work in the sons of disobedience. You know, I love watching uh, YouTube videos of illusionists. I love to see the people that can make things look like they're happening in your life. Where is that rabbit appearing from? Where is that person able to stand when there's nothing to stand on? And it's just amazing to me watch these types of things, but knowing all the way it's fake. But yet I see these illusionists around the world, and I think one of the greatest shockers to humans on this planet is the fact that they are being deceived by the greatest illusionist that has ever existed. His name is Satan. Paul put it this way, that the people were following the prince of the power of the air. Friends, he's called the accuser, an adversary, the angel of light. He's called the father of lies, a murderer, a deceiver, the devil, a tempter, the ruler of the demons, God of this world. He's called the evil one, the serpent of old, the fallen star. He's called the thief, a ruler of the darkness. And friends, he's called the destroyer, just to name a few. He's called the prince of the power of the air here. That's Satan. That's the devil. Whether people in this world choose to believe it or not, before they have a relationship with Jesus Christ, they are worshipers of Satan. They are followers of the devil. 
It's hard to believe, but that's exactly what the truth of God's word tells us today. They were following him, whether they realized it or not in their ignorance. Hear me today, church, the devil is hard at work. He's a busy lion on the prowl seeking for someone to devour and destroy. Paul put it this way about how he was working. He said, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. He is leading and encouraging people to be disobedient and defiant to God and his holy word. It's exactly what the devil's trying to do. And the world is filled with idolatrous people, people who are worshiping idols of this world. Really, it's Satan in disguise, the illusionist. Friends, before Christ came into the heart of the church at Ephesus, they too were idolatrous people. Before Christ stepped into our lives, and changed us and made us believers in him. We too were idolatrous people. Historical lesson number one, we were dead. Historical lesson number two, we were idolatrous. Number three here today, he says, you were carnal. Verse three, among whom we once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Before Christ, you and I were just like the believers in Ephesus before they experienced a life change when they came to know Jesus Christ. Before Christ entered into our lives, we too were characterized just like the church at Ephesus was before they came to know Christ. Characterized by the deeds of the flesh, the passions and the desires of the flesh and its sensual cravings. Paul even gave a list to the church at Galatia to show them about what that carnal, fleshly lifestyle looks like, and it's supposed to be in the past. He said sexual immorality and impurity and sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, and divisions, and envy, and drunkenness, and orgies, and things like these, he said, just to give you a few. These are the things that you're supposed to stay away from. You know, friends, when I look at verses 1 through 3, there are two words there that are extremely encouraging to me today and should be extremely encouraging to you as well. Those two words that are found in verses 1 through 3 are the words were and the words, the word once. Paul put it like this way to remind them that they were in that way of life. They once lived according to the prince of the power of the air that is now working in the sons of disobedience which in other words he's saying this is in the past it's great to learn about our past so that we don't commit the mistakes that we made in the past friends we need to remember our sinful mistakes in the past so we don't repeat them in the future winston churchill in world war ii once put it this way those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it now hear my heart today, this is not a political statement. This is a biblical principle. I know that there's a lot of conversation floating around our nation today and even in the church today about the cancel culture movement. Friends, nowhere in scripture does it ever say that we're supposed to forget the mistakes of the past and write it off like it never happened. Instead, the Bible tells us time and time again that we see the mistakes of the past so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past in the future. That's exactly what God desires to tell us so that we don't go back and do it again. We learn from it and we avoid it. And Paul wanted the church to know this. He wanted the church at Ephesus to remember where they once were so that they don't live in that anymore, that they live in something else. Paul let it be known this way. He said this, in their sinful state of rebellion, they were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. Friends, we were no different than the church at Ephesus. Without Christ, we were children of wrath. Emphasis on the word were children of wrath. But praise God, Jesus Christ stepped up into our lives and made us alive in him. Amen? We were. A terrible state can be removed. But right here, he's in the negative. He's showing people, listen, you were dead before Jesus. You were idolatrous before Jesus. And you were carnal. You lived according to the flesh before you had a relationship with God. But then he starts to switch it around and give the positives to what's occurred now that's the fourth historical lesson. He says, you were loved. 
Verse 4 tells us, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Can't wait to write my dissertation. It's going to be the greatest buts of the Bible. Here it is. But God stepped up and showed up and changed the course of history for us. Praise Jesus, he did. And notice what he did. He was rich in mercy. He was rich in mercy to us. Why? Because of his great love for you and for me. He was quick to give us what we do not deserve. Because of his great love for us, he determined not to give us the punishment for which we would deserve, which would be hell. Instead, he stepped up and showed love and gave us a way out through his son, Jesus Christ. And praise the Lord, he did just that. If you remember back, Jesus told Nicodemus, the Pharisee, the ruler of Jews, some Jews in that area, this is what he told him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have ever everlasting or eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Now catch verse 18 here as he told Nicodemus. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Historical lesson, he reveals it here to them. He says, here's the deal. You are loved and you have mercy. And here it is in what Jesus Christ has done for you. Friends, he loves us. He cares for us. He wants to have a relationship and a connection with us. He was rich in mercy and his love is big as the whole outdoors. On his way to the cross, that's exactly what he had, a heart of love. And not only did he love, but friends, hear me today, he continues to love today. Those who would believe in his name, historical lesson, you were dead. You were idolatrous. You were carnal. But you were loved. Leads us to historical lesson number five. You are alive. What happens to the person who is alive in Christ? Four things here, and we wrap up. First, you're redeemed in Christ. Look at verse 5 tells us this. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Even when we were dead, Jesus Christ stepped up to the plate while we were dead in our sin. I picture this that, you know, knowing I understand that we have a lot of St. Louis Cardinal fans in the room and those watching online, spring training's underway. We know the first game's coming up on April 1st, by the way. It's to the Reds. It's, a home, it's an away game, if you didn't know. You're welcome. But I can imagine when Jesus Christ stepped up to the plate and what he was doing for us on Calvary, I can imagine Babe Ruth taking his cue directly from Jesus as he prepared to die for our sins. I can imagine Jesus pointing up into heaven like Babe Ruth once pointed to the outfield the ends of the field of the park. What Jesus is saying to his disciples, watch this, I'm about to knock this one out of the park. And his disciples looking back at him saying, what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> He's just saying, you just watch what's about to happen. As Jesus Christ died for us, the Bible tells us this, what he had for us. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much love he had in the midst of that to redeem us to rescue us from our sin. That's exactly what he did for us by dying, shedding his blood so that we could have forgiveness of sins. In order to be made alive in Christ, he had to die a death that, listen, we could not die ourselves. And he did just that for us. And praise the Lord from his redeeming act on the cross, we can have everlasting life in him. Wicked people can be forgiven and made new in him. That's what Jesus did for us, even when but also, those who are in Christ are raised with Christ. Verse 6 tells us this, And raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Oh, friends, hear me today. We have been raised up with Christ, and we have a seat with him in glory. Paul told the church at Philippi this. He wanted to remind them of the same fact. He said, but listen, our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Praise the Lord, friends. We are raised with Christ. We have a seat 
that is reserved for us in heaven. Our citizenship is planted firmly there. Jesus told the believers about this salvation, this relationship that is secure in Jesus Christ. Jesus told this in John chapter 10, verse 27 to 30. He wanted to remind them how secure this relationship was, how he has raised them up and that we will get to be with him for all eternity. He said this, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish. He's talking about the second death, which is separation from those that are gonna be going to hell, those are gonna be going to heaven. He says, you're not gonna experience that going to hell and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one, again, is able to snatch them out of the Father's hands, for I and the Father are one. Our security of our eternal destination is assured here in this passage of Scripture. We are raised with Christ. In the ages to come, we are going to experience, as Paul told the church at Ephesus here, the fullness of God's grace for all eternity. Think about this. When I made a decision to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, there was a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Yes, it's mine. For I met the author of my story, and it's mine. Yes, he's mine, right? When we made a decision for Christ, what are we? We're raised with him. We have a relationship, that connection with him. For all eternity, we're going to get to be with him. And our name is written down in his book. Well, what about you today? Is your name written down in his book? Can you be able to sing part of that story? There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, and he's mine. Because that decision you made for Christ, well, if it's not, friend, today it can be. Just a few moments, you have an opportunity to make a decision for Jesus Christ. But those who believe in him today, you're redeemed in Christ, you're raised with Christ, but you're also rescued by Christ. Verse 8 tells us this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, lest any man should boast, so that no one can boast. Again here, he uses the word grace. The word charis in the Greek means grace, goodwill. It means favor. It means loving kindness of God. This is where God gave his grace, the gift by which we do not deserve. He gave us heaven, eternal life, and the opportunity to be in his presence for all eternity. That's grace. To be rescued, to be saved. Do you want to know how to be saved today? He tells us if you want to have your name written down in glory, here's how to do it. It is by grace and it is through faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe today you think that you've done some good things, maybe, to warrant your way into heaven. Maybe you say, I've helped old ladies across the road, or maybe I've contributed a couple extra bucks to the Salvation Army. Done some good deeds in my life, and it's going to get me to be with God in heaven. Friends, let me tell you today, our good is not what God considers as good enough. If you think that you had any part to play in your salvation, Paul here wanted to show exactly that your thinking was wrong. If you could work your way into heaven, then you would not need a God to help you to get there. You could boast on your own merit. Look what I did. Look how I made it here. Friends, there's a lot of people in this world they're walking around thinking they can do enough good to get to be in paradise with God. Today, if you think that you did anything to save yourself, allow me to wake you up. You're delusional. We cannot rescue ourselves from what our sinful decisions have brought down upon us. We needed someone to come down and rescue us from our sinful mistakes. And I was grown up in the country, and let me tell you, that ain't you is Jesus Christ. He's the one that did all the work to save and redeem you. You did none of it on your own. To those in this world that would believe that they're good enough to get to God and to get to an eternal paradise, allow me to break it down for you real quick. You're not good enough. And let me take you and show you how you're not. Now I want to bring forth this message here, part of this message in here. I want to show you 
a great way to be able to encourage people who think they're good enough to get to heaven how they're not. And we're going to take and use the way of the master here and walk you through briefly the Ten Commandments of God. If we were to just take you through the top Ten Commandments and see if you're good enough to get to be in heaven, let's just see how you measure up this morning. And let me tell you, I do this time and time again when I talk to people. Let's just walk them through. So let's see how good you are this morning if you can get to be in heaven by just the Ten Commandments. First, in Exodus 20 verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. In other words, is God first in your life? I guarantee in this room and online, everybody watching, there's been a part in our life, a point in our life when God was not the first one in our life, our priority. Number two, you shall not make yourself any carved images. You shall not bow down to serve them. I can tell you in our lives, are you living for anything but God? Because we oftentimes find ourselves doing that. It's serving things rather than serving God. And I can tell you all of us have been there too. Number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Have you ever used the name of God in an inappropriate way? We could all say yes. We've all been there. We've all done that. Number four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Have you neglected time with God? Absolutely we have. Friends, we're at the fourth one and we're not doing too good. Number five is honor your father and your mother. Have you ever dishonored your parents across this room? Mm Mm-hmm. I remember the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. That's how I grew up. (laughs) Friends, we've all done that. Number six now, this is my favorite one. It says, you shall not murder. Because this is normally at the point where someone comes back to me and says, well, hey, hey, I broke the first five, but listen, I've never committed murder. And I'll say, you know what? That's a good point. But do you know what John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 15? He says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life and is abiding in him. So if you've ever hated anybody, you're considered a murderer. So have you ever disliked somebody or hated somebody? And they're like, yes. <laughs> it's like, okay, let's go to number seven. You should not commit adultery. And sometimes they're like, well, I haven't done that either. So I'm good there. And I'll say, well, I understand that. But Jesus actually said this in Matthew chapter five, verse 28. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully with intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Spiritual adultery, lust. I said, have you ever lusted after somebody? Yes. Number eight. You shall not steal. Have you ever taken something that doesn't belong to you? And yes, we all have. Let me first tell you, if you want a pen here from the church, it's free. You're not stealing. You can take the church pens. That's okay. All right, we want you to have them. Take them out to people. It's okay. But we've all done that. We've all taken something that didn't belong to us. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. That means you're lying. Have you ever told a lie? Well, absolutely, we've all done it. Number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his servants, his animals. And he even says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, or anything. So has there ever been anything that you wanted to have that somebody else had that you wanted to have? Yes, friends, out of the 10 commandments, we've all messed up on every single one of them. We're of no earthly or spiritually heavenly good. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came because we weren't good enough to be with God. He died for us so that we could get access to God. Through his sacrifice, we are of no earthly good and no heavenly good. It's important to remind ourselves of that fact. Friends, take that to your friends. Take that to your coworkers. Take that to people and say, hey, how do you think you're going to get to go to heaven? And they'll say, I bet I'm a good person. I do good things. I guarantee you about 95% of the people I talk to and ask, how are you going to get to heaven? And they say, I do good things. Even Christians say it. And the reality is, is the good things we do are a result. The evidence of our salvation, it doesn't make us saved, those things that we do. And that's exactly what Paul here wanted to point out to them in his final thing, to let them know what they were in Christ. That they were repurposed for Christ. Verse 10, he says it this way, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him, so that, watch this, we would walk in in them. Paul told the church at Ephesus, they were created to be workers for Christ. Hear me today, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a worker for Christ. You know, you may not be a full-time paid worker, part-time paid worker for Christ, but you are a worker for Christ. And friends, let me tell you something. There's work to be done. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but watch this, the laborers the workers are few. 
you're a believer today in this room or watching online here in my heart, you are a worker for Jesus Christ. To work in those things that God wants us to do. Well, you may say, well, Neil, I don't understand. What am I supposed to do? I'm glad you asked. Three things that we always focus on here at Ridgecrest, right? Hopefully it's being ingrained in your mind every time you come here on Sunday morning. We do this every time during our prayer and praise time. We are here to worship, to grow, and to share. How can I be a worker for Jesus? I'm here to worship the one true God. I'm here to grow in my, non, my knowledge and understanding of his word. And I'm here to share the love of Christ with the people that God places in my path. You want to know how to work for Jesus? It's right there. Worship, grow, and share. Friends, hear me today. I want to remind you, as I just said it moments ago, because I don't want anybody leaving here or turning us off saying, this is what I thought he said. Your good works and your good deeds that you do do not get you access to God. It's Jesus Christ and his shed blood alone that gets us access to God. The works are just the things that we get to do afterward because we say, God, I'm so blessed to be in a relationship with you. I'm so happy and now I want to serve you faithfully. That's exactly what God wants us to understand. We're his workers, excited and glad to work for him because we know where we've come from. Dead, idolatrous, carnal, fleshly, but all the while we were loved and God made us alive in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you today. We thank you for your word, for this message of truth here that we see that you've laid out for us. Lord, for this message, it was written to believers to remind them of where they've been and where they are now in Christ. But today, maybe somebody hears this and says, you know what, I've, I understand this truth that we've seen in this passage of scripture in Ephesians chapter two. I am dead. I am fleshly. I'm living for the ways of this world. I'm living according to the prince of the power of the air. I'm walking with the sons of disobedience. I'm defiant and I'm outright rebellious to God. But today, that changes. Today, God, I want a relationship with you. And if that's you that desires to enter into that relationship, you can talk to God right now and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the things that I've done against you and your word. Jesus, thank you for coming and for living and for dying for my sin. And Jesus, I pray that you'd help me to no longer live in my former way of life. But Jesus, I pray that you come into my life, be my Lord, my boss, my master, and my savior, and help me to be a faithful worker for you. If you made that decision in just a moment, we're gonna rejoice with you. But Father, all throughout this room, all those watching online, Lord God, we sit there and we hear this passage of scripture and God, today it should be an encouragement for those who believe. God, you've strengthened us with grace today to know and to understand, Lord, what you've brought us out of from death, from an idolatrous relationship with Satan and the things of this world, from living carnally, Lord, from living for the, according to the flesh and its desires. And you brought us out of that because of your great love and because of what you did for us on the cross, you made us alive with you. And so Lord Jesus, we thank you for that. God, may you give us boldness to live out our life for you as we strive to be workers in your holy kingdom. For it's in Christ's name that we do pray, amen. If you made that prayer of salvation, I want to rejoice with you at the end of our time together. And we're going to be standing right down front. I'd love to talk to you about that decision for Jesus that you made. I want to thank you and encourage you. Stand strong and firm for the Lord Jesus. Before you leave, I want to have an opportunity before you leave uh, to honor somebody who served in our church and has helped us out. And that is one of our police officers, Tanya Culp. And so we want to give a straight up great a thanks and appreciation for her. She is retiring next month. She has spent almost 30 years in law enforcement for the St. Charles Police Department. Almost 30 years. And so we want to honor her today. We got you a gift of a great steak dinner or lunch, depending on what you'd like, from Olive Garden or Longhorn Steakhouse because we love you so much. We want to thank you for being here to protect us and to serve our community. Amen.
So thank you, Tanya. We appreciate you. And you were one of my first ride-alongs, and so I appreciate you and your relationship. Would you stay, remain standing and let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this day. We thank you for Tanya, for her ministry, Lord, here and at the other churches she served at. And Lord, for her ministry in the community, God, how she sought to protect and to serve our community for almost 30 years as a police officer. God, I pray that you would protect her, keep her safe until her final retirement date on the 23rd next month. And God, I pray that you would bless her with many wonderful years in retirement, Lord Jesus, for it's in your name that we all do pray. Amen. Amen. God bless. Have a great week, Ridgecrest. Thank you, Tanya.